We have a particularly fascinating presentation by Louise Prophet LeBlanc. Um, she is a storyteller, originally from the Nacho Nayak Dun First Nation in northeastern Yukon in Mayo. And she has been, I'd say, very strongly committed to the heritage of indigenous artists in Canada for quite a long time, for over, four, over 35 years, as it's noted here. Uh, she served on the, as the Aboriginal Arts Coordinator for the Canada Council of the Arts and was, before that, employed by the Heritage Branch of the Yukon Government. She helped to co-found the Yukon International Storytelling Festival and it was involved in the Society of Yukon Artists of Native Ancestry. Um, I should point out that I actually had to cut about five paragraphs from uh, her, her CV, you might say, because she's done so many things. And they're so fascinating, I could only fit so many uh, in this introduction. She's now retired and living in Quebec, uh, north of uh, Gatineau and, and Ottawa. And uh, we have really quite a remarkable presentation today from her about seven spirit bowls, caribou spirit bowls, and uh, the seven valleys of Bahá'u'lláh. So, Louise, we will switch over to your uh, computer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert and Boyd. And uh, it is my pleasure to be invited by the Wilmette Institute uh, to do this webinar. I've been uh, excited to be able to learn how to do this. You know, we should always be in that mode of learning, to be in a culture of learning. So today I'm learning how to work with my fellow believers, and I thank you all a lot. Before we start, I just wanted to um, say a, a prayer in my language, because I um, don't hear my language much in Quebec, and i just like to offer this prayer in Northern Tishomani. <laughs> Klahohuki, the tatiki, Giaki, Oyaki, Nitsat Ayat Sacho, Nitsat Aling. Of course, that's a prayer from the Bob. So, as I said, that it is my it is my pleasure uh, to present my work today as an artist, and um, I've been affiliated with the arts for many years. Um, but only in the last probably five years since I've retired, I've recognized even more that art is a tool. It's a tool in which we can utilize traditional forms and different methods of offering spiritual sustenance to humanity. So uh, your, the first slide that you're seeing here are um, seven caribou spirit bowls and I refer to them as spirit bowls because once I had come to an understanding of seven and how important that is is uh, with these seven spirit bowls I, I recognized when I was making them that seven is very important it's important not only to the traditional teachings of the the region that I'm living in right now because they have the seven grandfather teachings but there are seven seas there's seven directions there's seven days in a week. seven is a very important number so it shouldn't surprise us that Baha'u'llah even before his declaration decided and made this uh, wonderful exposition of really the process, the journey that we all go through every moment of our existence to come to an understanding of who we are in the world and how we have to move through these different valleys or these different uh, conditions of self. So in understanding what I had to prepare for an exhibition which had to be related to reconciliation, I thought, well, I think I have the best um, proposition which comes from the manifestation of God for this day. So that's why I created these bowls, which each bowl was named after each of these valleys from Baha'u'llah. And that's why I'm doing this um, presentation is to 
or this year, which is the bicentenary year. So before you, on this first slide, you'll see these seven vessels. They're made out of um, caribou hide. Um, they're wrapped with a babiche, which is also the leather hide of the caribou. They are adorned with a copper-coated leather pieces and uh, some beautiful copper coins, which were old pennies. Pennies are non-existent now in Canada, so I decided to make good use of these copper pennies. And for a lot of people in the traditional sense, copper was uh, representative of wealth, but also of generosity. As the teachings for most indigenous people is if you have a lot, you have a greater responsibility to give away. So this is um, kind of the premise of the, of the presentation. So this next uh, slide you see before you is art as a means of building bridges in our community. And I feel strongly that the Indigenous people really have flourished in Canada, particularly I've noticed they've really flourished in the last, I would say, 40 years. And prior to that, their, their art practice was not really appreciated by the Western world. It's not appreciated by those people who collected arts. And I, I really feel that it probably got started in the last century. So I'm, I, I make mention here that since the coming of this new religion of God, many indigenous people have embraced the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And uh, because we didn't have a written language, many of our spiritual understandings are mental understandings, our emotional understandings were embedded within our art practice. And so, and I guess that's probably why I'm very associated with storytelling is because a lot of knowledge, ancient knowledge, spiritual knowledge, which is apropos for the day that we are living in, is contained within these stories. And so this is why I um, wanted to make this presentation as well, so I could tell the story from my own understanding of the Seven Valleys. And the um, image that you see on the right is a work in progress, and I'm making this as a gift, I suppose, for this 200th year since the birth of Baha'u'llah, which we're celebrating. The world will be celebrating on October the 21st. And this is made out of the seeds from a maple tree. So it's really Canadian, eh? <laughs> And so these are seeds which are going to be tacked down onto a piece of beautiful raw silk. So and just to make this thing, the presentation, relative to what's going on in Canada, in 2014, our government in Canada uh, released the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report. Now this report really focused on uh, the work of many people for for many years, uh, I think approximately six years, that talked about what happened to the indigenous population in Canada. What by putting their children into residential schools and this re this removing children from parents, from community, from language, from land, and all of those things that happened in between. So the Commission's responsibility was to uh, record these stories, record these occurrences, uh, so that Canada would know what happened, and so that we can begin to reconcile the injustices that occurred. And so this is why these two terms, truth and reconciliation, uh, were pulled together because without the acknowledgement of these truths we could not go forward with reconciliation. So of course these um, that put in my mind you know after reading these 94 recommendations of how I can take some of the teachings that I've been blessed to know about from the Baha'i faith and present them in, in a way in which is probably more easily understood and this is why I began to study the Seven Valleys of Baha'u'llah. As you know, Shoghi Fendi was very much um, supportive of how we can reach the indigenous community, the aboriginal peoples of the Americas. 
He indicated, he said, these people for the most part are downtrodden and ignorant, but should receive from the Baha'is a special measure of love. And every effort must be made to teach them. He said their enrollment in the faith will enrich them and us and demonstrate our principle of oneness of man far better than words or wide conversation of the ruling races ever can. Abdu Baha, of course, and this was uh, quoted by Shoghi Effendi, he said the ancient beauty hath in his sacred tablets explicitly written that the day of their abasement is over. So that means that we're moving into this whole new era where those that are impoverished and downtrodden and oppressed, this is their time in which they are going to rise and offer their gifts to society. This is my understanding and one of the ways that I've come to realize is by this great exposition of the arts in all the genre, not just in the visual art practice but in all the genre. He said his, his bounty, God's bounty will overshadow them and this race will day by day progress and be delivered from its age-long obscurity and degradation. And certainly in Canada, we, we saw this obscurity as an Indigenous person myself. You know, I, many times we would have discussions amongst ourselves and we would feel invisible. The richness of our culture, the richness of our knowledge of how we should behave in the world, how we should treat each other as human beings, how we should regard the land as that which feeds us and the gift from God. But these two quotes that I've just um, offered to you um, put things into better perspective for me um, when I was asked to be shown some work at the Yukon Art Gallery last fall. And I, I realized that I had to create a piece that just wasn't beautiful, which I definitely tried my very best to make them as perfect as I could but also to demonstrate this idea of reconciliation from the beginning of how do we search out ways and means to reconcile our differences, how do we find ways in which we can reconcile and know truths and so this is my this kind of impacted my decision to make these bowls. Indigenous knowledge is embedded in many ceremonies and creations and they can be interpreted as reminders of the strength which lies within the spiritual ancestry of a people. So truly, art comes from the world of spirit. It comes, everything, all knowledge comes from God. So naturally, um, this process of being able to create, being able to make things is directly relative to being open to the spirit of creation. And what you see before you, of course, I'm very attached to caribou. As you can see, those are that's a caribou antler, which is laid near a, a root of a tree and then just laid out on a, on a beautiful red cloth with some stones and some feathers. And so this represents the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the, the mineral kingdom, and everything else around us. And of course it's encircled with air. The only thing that's not there is water, but this is very close to a, a stream. In 2014, um, probably in their second year of getting together, getting it, uh, the commission up and going for the Government of Canada, our beloved National Spiritual Assembly of Canada submitted a piece to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they ended their um, presentation, and this is online for those people who are interested in learning more about this submission, you can Google the National Spiritual Assembly of Canada the submission to the Truth and Reconciliation. But what really inspired me was their following the, their comments, and these are the words, it says, as we walk this path together in Canada, and I guess we could say in the world, 
We will learn lessons and practical measures that will help us to guide the healing of other divisions between world's peoples, the world's peoples. So this statement empowered me to take this step forward in my own art practice. I felt this responsibility to guide a healing in a practical way. And the best way I knew how, of course, was through the arts. So I just got busy and um, found a, um, a source for caribou hide because there's very few caribou that live in the area that I live in, Quebec. And um, I wanted each of these, once I, de I decided on the seven valleys, I wanted each of these to represent these sacred valleys which Baha'u'llah encourages us to walk through. He encourages us to walk through these throughout our lives, our entire life. And the reason that I chose caribou is because this animal, which is precious to all northerners in the circumpolar world, is an animal which is constantly preparing for travel. So I thought that that was a great juxtaposition between traveling through these seven valleys and the caribou's annual cycle of traveling to their calving in the summer months and then coming back in the winter. Uh, and they've been doing this migration now for a thousand years. And then I asked my good friend Robert Stockman and uh, Boyd, our technician, what this image was on the right. And yes, for all artists, you'll realize that in order for hide to be malleable, any untanned hide, it needs to be soaked in water. And this hide is being submersed in my tub at home. <laughs> I don't have a proper studio. Uh, and it's uh, being laid in the water with stones. I prayed for a hot day, and I got a very hot day in Quebec. I took that malleable hide which is what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be malleable. We're supposed to be flexible in our search for truth. We have to be open to all sources of knowledge, but we have to investigate it, investigate this truth. So I took this wet hide, and I have these bowls, and wrap them around these bowls, and tightened them up with elastics. And because it was 36 degrees, they dried very quickly. On my, on my steps outside. And that's how they looked when they were embellished with this copper that I referred to. And I just set them on my table. There's six there because I hadn't finished the seventh on this slide. They look, they look really nice in the light because they're transparent. And when I use them in ceremonies, because when we have gatherings and I'm trying to explain these seven valleys to friends, I put a little uh, tea light into them, and then you can see their transparency. And I suppose that if we do practice our spiritual lives together and, and seek out truth and acceptance of people, because that is the goal of reconciliation, is unity, then we become transparent like these hides. So, of course, each of these steps had to be carefully and patiently thought through. And I already made um, mention of this being softened in water. And with each creation of these bowls, each piece, I was reminded of this quote of Abdul Baha. Always conscientious as well. And the Bob makes reference to these. Uh, it's guidance to artists and artisans and people who create things with their hands, but Abdul Baha says it very clearly. He said, the man who makes a piece of note paper to the best of his ability is giving praise to God. Briefly, all effort and exertion put forth by man from the fullness of his heart is worship. If it is prompted by the highest motives and will do service to humanity. So those were the two juxtaposition, not a juxtaposition, but these two twin things was to create these as part of my worshiping God and also service to humanity. So I didn't want art to just sit there in a gallery. I wanted art that will instruct, will inform, will encourage people in their spiritual journeys. 
And this following one, which I have come to know as the artist's prayer, which I've shared with many artists. And this is from the Bob. He says, Oh my God, thy handiwork has always been complete, always encompassing, perfect, and unfailing. And it will always continue to be perfect, unfailing, complete, and all-encompassing. Thou hast commanded thy servants from the beginning that hast no beginning till the end that hast no end to produce handiwork with the utmost perfection. For this verily, this is verily the reflection of the perfection of thy handiwork. Educate then, O oh my God, the people of the Bayon in such wise that no product may be found amongst them but that the very utmost perfection of industry shall be, made, may, shall be manifest therein. For verily thou hast desired by this law to build the earth anew by virtue of thy glorious handiwork through the hands of thy servants. That was so inspiring to me. And so I tried my very best to honor his holiness the Bob and of course to be really um, encouraged and inspired by Atul Baha. So I've already mentioned this business of transpar transparency, the spirit bowl. And I decided that within contained within each of these bowls, which you cannot see, is I, I put a, a caribou tooth. And when I put the tooth into the bowl for transportation, I gave each of those teeth the names of each of these valleys. Um, the, the curator of the show th found that really, well, she said, first of all, she found it odd, but then after a while, when she read what I described to her as these valleys, she, she understood. So when we're walking towards reconciliation, the first thing we, we want to do is we want to understand what we're searching for. What are we searching for? We're searching for a means of reconciliation. We're searching for a way in which we can become united, whether it's you know with our Lord, united with our family, our community, our country, our countrymen, the world. So this is our first valley that we venture into. And of course we're all in constant search for meaning and purpose in our lives. And this valley allows us to search for truth. And what does truth require? It requires patience with ourselves and others. This valley is a place where we go to let go and to sacrifice all things that we have seen, heard, or understood. So we can be clear and focused on what is required for our travels. And this is a valley, and this is a direct quote from Baha'u'llah, of course, he said, this is a valley where many friends are sought out in the hopes of finding the trace of the traceless friend. From this place, we venture into the next valley, the valley of love. And if we consider this, if our goal is to be in unity, and the purpose of justice is unity, then we have to learn how to love. And in learning how to love, we have to experience pain and fire is a symbol of this valley and I I that's what I I've informed you that I like to put a little fire into these bowls they're very very durable they're very strong these little bowls in this valley we discover our love for all created things the love for the creator ourselves our families our nations and everyone else on earth and I was so taken by this valley that in this valley we fear nothing and we do go a little insane, allowing us to be filled with the spirit and powerful enough to escape the claws of the eagle of love. And I know that a lot of my indigenous friends, they love that analogy of the claws of the eagle of love, because once that eagle catches you, you're caught. <laughs> so 
But once the heat of this valley dissipates, it opens up. And as you can see this image in front of you, it's open. It's, it feels like it, it has wings. And we enter this valley of knowledge. And as I had already said, the, all knowledge is from the Creator. All knowledge is from God. So this valley made me understand that there is ancestral knowledge. All peoples of the world have ancestral knowledge, and then we have newly acquired knowledge. And thank God we have this most recent acquired knowledge, and this is a knowledge of our beloved Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah says, in this valley we begin to see war as peace, and see the end in the beginning, friendliness and anger, and find in death the secrets of the spirit spirit world and in this valley we look inward and, uh, and our, with our inward and outward eyes and begin to see things unimaginable and are blessed with the things of the sacred allowing us to begin our, our trek into the importance of the fourth valley and I just wanted to just speak a little bit about the eyes of an artist you see your raw materials before you but you have no idea with your outward eye and the spirit is what introduces you to that looking with an inward eye. And so just for the sake of beauty here, I put this beautiful polished black stone in the center. And so people don't know what that is about. It's the inward. It represents the inward eye. And for people that can't associate with these the shot on the side, that's a candle that was lit during the fast, this last fast that I was privileged to be with, with my husband for the 19 days. And so that's just a lit candle in a beautiful handcrafted bowl, pottery, and a piece of sweet grass. So it's the flame. We are drawing closer to the light of unity. And so this is the next valley that we move into, is a valley of unity. And this is a valley that traditional people or people that have lived on the land and have lived close to the land and nature and all those things that are provided for us. This valley is a valley that we always try and maintain for our survival. In order for people to really be able to collectively live together, we must be without prejudice. We must be without anger or hate or envy in order to collaborate and to find this true unity. So in honoring our differences and to see them as strengths. And in this valley we become reacquainted with oneness. Our world takes on a whole new meaning and we envision the far-reaching implications of this ancient teaching of unity. I think in all the indigenous populations of the world, this is, this is an essence, a foundation of our teachings, is to maintain this uh, place of strength. Once moving into that area, we were calmed and where we find ourselves in this valley of contentment because that unity provides us with the strength of everybody that we're around and it brings us to the arena of our own personal spiritual emotional and and, and physical freedom where we can trust our fellow man or woman where we feel that god is providing for us, so we have that faith in our heart, there's a freedom to that. No longer is there a question of our oneness. It gives us confidence to understand the tragedies of our lives and how these tragedies provides us with a greater understanding and this contentment, you know, and I, I'm, I'm looking at this now, you know, when there's so much tragedy going on in the world, you know, with all of these um, things that are happening, disasters in the world and recognizing how people's coming together 
to face floods and earthquakes and fires. It's really nature is drawing us together. And this is why we move into our, our sixth valley. Wonderment. I was told by Boyd that I should say where these photos came from. So this one in the contentment uh, slide is um, just a, a shot going by in the woods. It's a sunset and it's in Quebec. But the next one is my homeland. And it's in a valley and it's in a valley on the, in the space between the Yukon and southeast Alaska. And it's these wonderful, gorgeous mountains. So it does represent this valley of wonderment. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful place. Now, this valley that we find ourselves in, of course, helps us to re and reminds us of the beauty of the world. And at every moment, we envision this wondrous place, a new creation. And we become so filled with this astonishment, realizing how this holds wisdom and spiritual truth. And I can still remember when I first uh, embraced the Baha'i faith, is that I think I was stuck in this valley of wonderment for a long time because everything took on a new color. Everything, I was totally astonished by color. There was more color in my life. I looked at the trees in the sky and and even people's eyes and and everything just took on this this new glow there was a new richness in my life and we experienced this wonderment of how our ancestors stayed connected to the sacred circle of life trying to maintain richness in our spirit and living constantly in a state of acceptance and gratefulness for all in which we were provided. I think thankfulness is the nature of this valley. Thankful even when we have very little to be thankful to be alive. In this valley, of course, we're challenged to become better humans, to overcome our lower nature, which is referred to in some of the writings as animal nature, but it's our lower nature, to rise to that condition of nobleness, to be the best we can be. So after traversing this high summit, you see these mountains here as a high summit, we come to our last and seventh valley. And this is a valley of true poverty and absolute nothingness. And I found that this last valley, to me, is the valley of reconciliation, where nothing can get in the way of wanting to encourage unity. Nothing can deter us from this journey of knowing who we are and what our purpose is in life. Our purpose is to serve God, to obey His laws, and to serve humanity. And this is where nothing else matters because we found our spiritual path which ultimately has led us to reconciliation. And it's in this valley, I love this quote from Baha'u'llah. He says that we have to continue to listen with heart and soul to the songs of the Spirit and treasure them as we would our own eyes. This is the most powerful valley and it brings us closer and closer to our truth and our reality. I also remind friends when I'm explaining these things to them that these valleys are not linear. We get tossed back in the valley of search. We get tossed back into, into the valley of knowledge where we might need new knowledge. So it's not linear. But ultimately this journey influences our approach to this momentous task of seeking out true reconciliation. And it is a constant choice in all of our lives. All of us are walking towards this. So, thank you for traveling with me. This is uh, basically what I've come to understand in, in the artistic uh, form that I've chosen to do today. And so, 
I'll be open for questions. And as I usually say when I give a storytelling presentation is that I'll only answer the questions that I can. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, as, uh, you told me is the side of the Yukon River in Yellow Horse, in, uh, in uh, White Horse. White Horse, yes. This White is, Horse. yes, so that's the mighty Yukon that you're looking at. The beautiful yep. running path. So when you go there, Robert, you can go for your morning run there. I'll remember that, yeah, if I can ever get up there for that purpose. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Um, yeah. I, I'm very, very inspired by this use of the seven valleys to discuss the whole subject of reconciliation and I and really I have to commend the Canadian communities the, the peoples of Canada for really stepping out on this path of reconciliation and working towards a social reconciliation all of our societies all around the world have a long way to go but in many ways, I think the Canadians are leading us, certainly in terms of the relations for the tribal peoples of the United States and the dominant society. We have far, far greater distances to travel than the First Nations have been able to travel in Canada. At least that's my impression. Yes. And I am um, very inspired by this uh, whole effort, and, um, and I thank you again for for this. The bowls, you mentioned a polished black stone in one. Yes. You mentioned the caribou teeth uh, in them. Are there any other things in the bowls? No. Just spirit. And, and when and I when I take them to ceremony, I put little tea lights into them. And those the, the seven they're like little lanterns they're they're lit for the entirety of the of the gathering and the exteriors of the bowls are pretty much identical as well I gather yes they are yes. though they represent the unity in that sense of the of the process through their yes. commonalities yes and they're all cut from one hide, which is another juxtaposition, you know, if you want to look at it symbolically, you know, we're all cut from the same cloth. <laughs> That's right. Yes. How many times have you been able to make this reckon this presentation? And in what different places? You I you mentioned you've done it in you in Yukon. I, I you just did it in, in Toronto, you were just talking about it, I, I suppose, this weekend. Uh, no, that was in Quebec City. Oh, it was in Quebec City, yeah. yeah. It was at an indigenous gathering, an indigenous Baha'i gathering. Sorry about that, there's a plane going over. Um, yes, there was an indigenous Baha'i gathering held in Quebec City, and I lit those, these seven um, lights, these seven bowls, and of course a lot of people from that area know of the grandfather teachings. And uh, so they could relate to the, the seven valleys in that in those terms as well. So respect, love, courage, truth, honesty, wisdom, and there's one more. Yes. Three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so they could relate to those grandfather teachings. What are there, sort of, any, are there any, questions? any questions at the moment? Let me see. I don't see any questions yet. Um, okay. I'm sure people will be thinking about this um, yeah. subject too. Okay. What sort of other responses have you had? So you've made presentations in Yukon and in Quebec City. Yes. How, and, when did you uh, complete the spirit bowls? Tell us about the, the, the process. How long did it take and when did you get started? Okay. When did you finish? Okay. Well, I, I started um, probably in July, 
just seeking out and getting the raw material. It doesn't take very long. That's why I, I preface my statement by saying I prayed for a, for a hot day because uh, these are natural materials and so they need to be uh, pulled together by a natural uh, phenomenon is how I look at it. And so putting these hides, these bowls outside, they dried very quickly. And so I popped the bowls out of them and they, that, that was their mold. Mm -hmm. So he came together very, very strongly. And then I was able to embellish them with the copper coins and the copper uh, wrappings and things like this to make them beautiful. Very durable. And so they were, they were made in, in the middle of August, but it only took me probably four days. Uh, two days of soaking and then four days of actually creating them and, and embellishment and getting the correct uh, tension around each one of them. And then on the seventh day, they were ready for shipping to the Yukon. Wow. So that was the first place that they were shown. And it was a beautiful uh, exhibition and because the curator found a caribou hide with fur on it. Mm -hmm and established it in the gallery space with the little lights. And I was, I was uh, quite moved when she said, you know, Louise, when we took out the spirit balls, something very calm left the gallery. Hmm. <laughs> so I said, well, I guess that's reconciliation, because when you reach that point of absolute nothing nothingness, there is such a calm. I'm impressed because I remember you, you, you gave, I think you gave me the title for this talk yes. quite a few months before you actually did the bowls. Yes, that's true. Yeah, you, you, you had the vision. You yes. had the vision. You knew what you were going to do. Yes. The inspiration had already arrived, but the yes. results had not come out. That's, that's marvelous. We have a couple of yes. questions now. Um, Perjaya wants to know how you acquired the caribou hide and I suppose also the antlers and these kinds of things. Oh, well I have sources back home. I'm from the north um, and the, there's thousands of caribou that migrate uh, in and around my community north of the community in the Bonaplume area and they migrate. They go north to um, the coast in Alaska for the summer months and then they return in the winter. And when they return in the winter, just near spring, this is when my people, the Nacho Nayak Down First Nation, this is when we hunt them. So I asked one of my friends if he had a caribou hide. He sent it to me because I'm living in the south. So that's how I got the caribou hide. And when I was moving uh, from the Yukon, and I knew that I would miss my country terribly, um, I brought caribou antlers. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think my husband tried to stop the movers from taking them, but I said, do not move anything. If you're not going to move them, you do not take anything else. So I was pretty adamant about them coming with me, and I'm so happy I did because I've been able to use them in installation. So the piece with the caribou handler is an installation. I do these installations at these gatherings that I attend. And by, and by the way, he, and Bob is on the list of people who are watching. I, I thought you'd like to know that. I, I, he did manage to tune in from Ecuador, it would seem. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, Shahla asks this question. Can a process mm -hmm. similar to the reconciliation whoops, with the First Nations, and I've just moved here, I've got a... Um, the first can it, a process of similar to the reconciliation of the First Nations be applied to reconciliation between African Americans and Euro Americans. It is interesting to note that the First Nations were here before the Euro Americans and the African Americans were brought here by force. I believe that the Afro Americans are indigenous people. And I uh, I really sincerely believe that yes, I think this is possible. And I've seen so much incredible um, pieces. African artwork is, is astounding. And I, I don't see why people 
couldn't create their own um, expressions of these valleys towards reconciliation. I think that's what we are encouraged to do is to uh, you know, read the sacred text and to be inspired by the sacred text for anything that we wish to do in our lives, whether it's to create a piece of artwork, whether it's to create a better thought for for what you're doing at work, uh, to create a better understanding between siblings or parents. You know, whatever we do in life, the sacred word is what can inspire us to achieve it to our best capacity. That's my understanding as an artist. Mm -hmm. Paul asks this interesting question. Uh, do you have any prophecies regarding this day from the indigenous peoples of Canada that you can share? Well, my grandmother was very um, instructive. I, I was very um, privileged to live with my grandmother when I was younger and of course that's where I, I was uh, educated in a nest of storytellers who were primarily her friends. And uh, before she died, um, she told me this. She said, never be proud before God. She said, you know, I raised all of your aunties and your uncles and your mother to believe. She said, now they don't go to church. This, this really um, was saddening to her. But she said, you know, we're all going up the same mountain. We're all going up the same mountain. We're just taking different trails. And she used to frighten me, actually, when I was younger, because she used to talk about the time of the end. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not understand that until I actually embraced the Baha'i faith. She said, in the time of the end, she said, two powerful medicine men are going to come to the world. One is going to be more strong than the other. She said, you look for them. They're going to bring all the people under one big tent. The black man, China man, white man, even us, she said, Indians. Hmm. We're all going to come under that one big tent. She said, you watch for that. Hmm. So that was, a, that, that was a prophecy that she shared with me. And so when I was 11 years old, I just so happened I went to um, children's classes in our little village. And I recognized that. Oh. Yeah, so that, that's one of the ones that I know from Canada full well. From personal experience, no less, too. Yes, exactly. Tell us about your storytelling. Wow, that's a long... Well, as I said, I was, you know, raised in a nest of storytellers because my grandmother was a fabulous storyteller. And the storytelling that I tell... Um, are from traditional stories, ancient stories, and, and each one of these holds many spiritual lessons. They are life lessons. So they are stories that share morals, they are stories about education of children, how we should behave as human beings one to the other, and uh, reminders of how small we are in terms of our, you know, um, under the Creator's eye, you know, we're, we're just like a speck, we're like a twinkle. And so all of these stories um, are very important for education, spiritual education. And also the, the process of learning from elders, memorization of stories, long stories. So at one time I, I kind of referred to myself as a storyteller, but now with many of my mentors, my teachers, those people that I honor, Angela Sidney, Kitty Smith, Joe Henry, my grandmother, and Prophet. Uh, these are my teachers. Um, and I realize now that I have a different association because I'm a story keeper. Mm -hmm. My responsibility is to share these stories. And whoever hears these stories, of course, they're filtered through their worldview. So you will hear the lessons that you that you need to hear, or mm -hmm. not. <laughs> so I'm as, very involved. Yeah. As a storyteller, do you just tell old stories, 
or do you invent new stories? Well, I don't have to invent because I'm living. <laughs> True. So I tell stories of my own experience, of my own life. Um, because we are we are a living story, you know. Mrs. Sydney, who became a Baha'i when she was about 83 or 84, she would always tell me. She said, "Louise, live your life like a story. So when you go, she said, people have a good story to tell about you." That's a good one. Yes. So, you know, if we're keeping tabs on how we are are as humans and how we interact. We should consider ourselves as a story in progress, I suppose. As an artist, you know, everything's a piece of art in progress. So we we too, my God has created us as a work in progress. Every day is work. And what other art do do you make? So we've seen the caribou spirit bowls. Yes. Of course, Westerners are associate artists with people who sing or paint or these kinds of things, but handiwork is increasingly, has long been recognized as being art. Yes. What sort of art yes. do you do? Tell us about some of your other projects and their... Well, I, yeah, I, I think you probably uh, saw, I, I work in textiles, I work uh, with traditional art forms and making clothing and slippers and all kinds of things made with hide. Um, I created what I refer to as a uh, reconciliation blanket. Right, I saw that. And, uh, that that told the story. It's on a kind of a. It's it was a um, hand woven blanket. It's a tartan looking blanket, but I put rose on there for when the people, the white people, first came to North America and how there was suffering amongst the indigenous people. So there's the white and the red, and the red has these little, um, every little um, bunch of wool. It's like they're dancing off the blanket, actually. And then, uh, so it moved into this painful time for the indigenous people. So that's represented by red woolen little um, pieces of wool that are attached to the blanket, the little tops of them. And then it moves into the two rows of black, and this 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 is a period in which we were removed from our homes and our families, removed from our land. So that's a very black period. But now we're moving into the yellow. So those are the four colors. Those are the four directions of the north being the white, the east is the yellow, the South is red, and then the west is either black, depending on your tradition, or blue, dark blue. So all of these colors, and then the last row, so that we have the white, uh, the non-indigenous people coming to North America, the suffering of the native people, and then they moved into this dark period, and now are moving into the period of light. And I, I refer to that period of light, this is the period of this manifestation, this this air era of Baha'u'llah's uh, manifestation of all of his teachings and so the, and then the last row are all of these pieces of wool, these little um, pieces of dancing, they're like little dancers and so all four colors are represented and that's, 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 our, that's our goal, that's our reconciliation line on the blanket. So I, I do work like that and um, yeah I paint, I'm also, I also do some painting, I write yeah. All kinds of work. You do a lot. That's good. <laughs> well, it's all for service. It's all for the service to humanity. That's what art is about. Of course. Yes. And, uh, and I, I have one, one other question for you here, and that's tell us about your people. Okay. Well, the Nacho and I have them people. Nacho it means big river. And that's the name. Then the English name is a Stuart, but it was called Nacho. So Nacho means big river. Nayak is of, like Nayak Dan means the people, like Dan is relative to Dini, Dene, Dana, Dena, and Dene. It mean, it's all the same. It means human. 
It means a person. That's what that that word means. So it's nacho nayaktan tana people. So we're the we're the people of the big river. We live seasonally. We moved with the seasonal migration of the fish in the river, all of the salmon moving back and forth in the riverways, the grayling moving from streams into the major rivers, the caribou migration. We lived off the land in accordance to what was most bountiful, the animals that were most plentiful. And uh, so I believe that the, the first um, non-indigenous people uh, moved into that area of the Yukon, northeastern Yukon, probably in the middle of the 1800s. And uh, the first people that moved into that area, of course, were looking for silver. So our people lived on the banks of the river and, and, and had an annual cycle. We didn't just live in one place. We had a, a place for every season, I suppose, where we, where we camped and lived together. Still living there. It's good. Still living there in a little small community, which is named after an Italian, wouldn't you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, George Mayo, Jorge Mayo, I guess that's how you probably pronounce his name. He was looking for silver. There was a lot of silver in our area. And it's so interesting because when the people first came looking for gold, gold was not a good mineral for, for us because it was too soft. I prefer to have obsidian or copper, which is good for arrowheads. Yep. Yeah, you can't make much out of gold. No, it's soft and it wears down and it disappears. Glitters. Yeah, exactly. It glitters, but it's not yeah. good for, any, for tactically anything. That's true. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, a couple of other questions have popped in. Uh, is there a site that we can view your interesting reconciliation cloth? Um, yes, it's on YouTube, I believe. Perhaps you can email that address to us and we can put it up on the web page where we have information about this talk so that, oh. of course, this recording will be available and people can then go click through yes. and see. Yes, you can, I, I think it's... Uh... Just uh, under reconciliation blanket, Louise Prophet Blanc, and it's on YouTube, so it's it's totally accessible. Somebody graciously took a video of it at the ABS conference. I remember that presentation. It was a really marvelous presentation. Thank uh, you, Robert. It was. It was really marvelous. Um, someone asks the question: Do you know Pashuka Melissa Clark, a Texas Indian? No, I don't. Who's Pashuka? Yeah, and a person who you probably do know, Little Brave Beeston, says, Thank you, Louise. I liked your connection to the reconciliation. Love to you. Oh, love back to you, too, Little Brave. And, of course, Bob has indeed sent a note saying, Hello from Ecuador. So that's good. Oh, that's uh, great. So I think that's all of our questions. And uh, it really has been a marvelous afternoon with you. I really want to thank you very much for this uh, opportunity for us to explore your art and to learn about how you express spiritual values through your art because this is something that is obviously so important for everyone to think about how our lives and all of the things we make and all the things that we do reflect our values and I think we've all learned something from you today about that so I, I have to thank you very much for that. Honor. And thank you for your support, Robert.